I couldn't escape the world as a little boy. When I was six years old, my parents bought me a globe, and they put this globe next to my bed. Now, this globe came in very handy because my parents always wanted me to go to sleep too early. And I didn't want to sleep, but when I turned on the light in my room, they could see it from the outside. They would come, and they would turn it off. So this globe had a light inside, but it was dimly lit, so I could turn it on, and they couldn't see. And for hours, I would stay awake. I would spin the globe and spin the globe. And because I was so bored, I started reading what was on the globe. There were big words on the globe. Those were the countries. And there were underlined words. Those were the capitals. And after about 18 months, I knew most of the countries and the capitals of the world. So while that was good, I didn't actually know where my own country was. See, Switzerland, where I was born, is a very small country. And on the map, there was some strange abbreviation for it. And there was nothing written like Schweiz, which is Switzerland in my native tongue. So I saw a country on the map that looked really big and looked really powerful. And it had an abbreviation, SSSR. So I decided for myself, this must be my country. And I thought for the longest time that my Switzerland was the Soviet Union. How disappointed I was when I found out it was not that great. When I became an adult, I started traveling to all these places. Now, I haven't visited all of them. I'm at about 117 countries and territories. And one of my key interests always is in the economies of the countries. How do the economies work? How do they affect the people? And how do they interact with each other? One of my most interesting economic debates I had in North Korea with my North Korean guide. When I asked my North Korean guide about the North Korean economy, he assured me it was the best economy in the world. When I asked him why, he said, you see, where you come from in the West, in Western Europe, in the United States, you have unemployed people. You have people that live on the streets, while in North Korea, everybody has a job. We have full employment. That's why North Korea is the best economy in the world. I was able to snatch this picture. In North Korea, you're not allowed to take picture of people. But I was able to take this picture of a traffic lady. And she clearly illustrates what full employment means. They don't have traffic lights in North Korea. They have people doing it. Can you imagine our European economy or our Western economy if we replaced all the machines and all the tools we use with people? How amazing would that be? We would have no unemployment. Or would it be? Well, maybe not, because North Korea is not a good economy, and certainly not a striving one. In contrast to North Korea is the United States. Until last year, the US was the world's leading economy, the largest in the world. And what's impressive to me, it had this spot for over 100 years. What's so powerful about the US economy is the capitalism it has exported to all over the world. There are two aspects to this capitalism that I find most powerful. The US attitude towards entrepreneurship and its entrepreneurial spirit, which is exactly what led me to the United States when I was 16 years old. Second is the middle class, a strong, striving middle class, which is necessary for a strong economy. But when I look at the US economy and when I look at capitalism today in the world, I am concerned. I am concerned about the sustainability, and I'm concerned whether this capitalism I have enjoyed is going to stay with us because of a rising trend in income inequality. The top 1% of the world today owns 50%, and the bottom 99% owns another 50%. How does that sound to you, the bottom 99%? Doesn't sound right, does it? And it doesn't sound sustainable. And it's even less sustainable when the prediction is that the top 1% goes to 51% next year, 52% the year after, and 54% by 2019. When looking at the last 20 years, income inequality has really risen rapidly. But why is that? What happened in the last 20 years? We all got connected to the internet. Connectivity rose. But is there really a link between connectivity and income inequality rising? When looking at connectivity, this illustrates more than 2 billion devices being shipped this year. 
When I started thinking about income inequality, and when I started thinking about connectivity in 2009, more than two billion people were connected to the internet. Today, it is over three billion people. But when I first think of connectivity and internet and the world, I think of good things. We get connected, which means we get closer to each other. Information is more freely available. And when we look at changes that happen in countries, regime changes, democratic movement as a result of connectivity, that's all a very good thing. So I started thinking more about it. And I was asking myself, so is connectivity connected or not? And I found something that is highly disturbing. I found that in today's world of connectivity, we have a very strange economic phenomenon. It's a phenomenon where billions of people work, contribute content and actions for free. And very, very few reap massive economic gain. Because people work and contribute for free, I'm calling this economic phenomenon freeism. How does freeism actually work? I participated in freeism this morning. I participated last night. So have most of you, and you don't even know it. In freeism, you use the internet as you do every day, you use it for free. But while you use the internet, what actually happens is that due to your actions, economic gain is created. Now this economic gain is large, very large. But what happens with this economic gain? It goes to very few. Now think about it. The way I define freeism, billions of people work, contribute, content and actions for free, and very, very few reap all economic gain. In a system where billions of people work for free and only very few reap all the gain, income inequality is virtually built in. Now, I'm not saying that freeism is the reason for rising income inequality, but what I am saying is it's a reason for it a reason most of us have never thought about. In 2009, I had a vision. I had a vision of, more, of a more fair world. Because when I think of freeism, what comes to my mind, it's not fair. It just isn't. It doesn't make any sense. So I thought, why not create an economy that is fair? Why not create an economy that's based on sharing? Why not create an economy where if we contribute, we actually earn a piece that that contribution creates? If value is created, we receive something from it as a return. So what I asked, when I asked my friends, what do you think about an economy that's based on sharing? And then imagine when we share with the people the people have a choice to either cash out for themselves or to share part of what they earn with the community. So sharing becomes true sharing, and they can do greater good in the world. So when I told my friends about this concept, they had three reactions to me. The first reaction, wow, this sounds like a great idea. The second reaction, this is too good to be true. And the third reaction, it's impossible to build this in the real world. Because most of my friends that I talked to had a first reaction of wow, I'm calling this new economic system wowism. So how does wowism work? In wowism, we all do the things we do regularly. We don't change our patterns. All the things we currently do for free, we now do for vow. In vowism, economic gain is generated, just like in freeism, the same way. From namely the actions of chat and call, in the example you will see later today. But in vowism, this gain is distributed back with the community. In fact, the way vowism is defined, Wowism is defined as an economic system 
where the majority of economic gain is shared with the community, and the community can then share in turn to do good in the world. Doing good. So in Taoism, the community earns. And then everybody in the community has a choice how much of that they want to cash out for themselves and how much of that they want to share with a cause, with a charity they care about. So what is this charity thing all about? It's difficult to do charity today for most of us. So in Taoism, we need to make it easy. We need to make it just a few clicks away. And I personally believe that through Taoism, when we give unselfishly, to a cause that we care about, it actually increases our happiness. There is an interesting TED talk by Dan Gilbert from Harvard about this concept of unselfish sharing and happiness. So I want this economy actually to create happiness among those that use it. Is this just a utopia or is this a reality? I mean, think about it. A new economic system that's based on sharing, a new economic system that's based on doing good, a new economic system that's based on making the people happy. Come on, can't be real. It's just a fantasy in someone's mind. And you know, for a long time it was, because between the summer of 2009 and early 2011, I couldn't figure out how to take this concept, this wow concept, and actually turn it into something real, turn it into a platform that can actually work and into a platform that can transform the way we use the internet every day. When I came up with a concept of how it could work, I called it Wow App. And we put together a team of 70 people and we started working on this concept of Wow App in early 2011. Initially, we thought it would take us about two and a half years. We knew we were building a new economy, but we weren't really thinking about it. We thought it was more like an app, a platform. But in reality, it turned out to be much more complex than that. Wow App is, Wowism in reality, a new economy. And after nearly five years, we finally released it to the world just a few weeks ago. Now, in Wow App, 70% of all revenue margin is shared with the community in real time. The community then chooses how much of that they want to share with themselves by cashing out or how much of that they want to share with a charity and cause they care about. Now, it is important to mention that I don't believe Wowism and Wow App is the solution to income inequality, but I think it's a step in the right direction. So, whereas connectivity brought us freeism, it is connectivity that can set us free from it. Ladies and gentlemen, let me end my talk with the world premiere of the Wow App Manifesto. Isn't there something we missed in this grand scheme where the internet is everywhere? When did something that was supposed to connect the world start to isolate us from one another? Every day we hear bad news and there's little you can do about it. How come the more the internet lets us know, the less it makes us feel? How come the more the world opens, the more indifferent we become to it? But what if I told you there's a new way anyone can do good? And it's right at your fingertips. Meet Wow App. The first platform where you can chat, call, earn and share and do good while doing so.
Wow App is a free app that shares more than 70% of all revenue margin with its members, which they can use freely or donate to one of nearly 2,000 charities featured in the app, so that sharing becomes true sharing. You can also do good for yourself by cashing out. The more we come together, the more we can make the world a better place. Join the WOW app community and discover the power of sharing. Let's make a difference in this world. It's time for WOW. Thank you very much.